Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's webcast on the wild landscapes of the Snake River. Um, my name is Rob Clavins. I'm the Northeast Oregon Field Coordinator for Oregon Wild. Um, and I'm lucky enough to live in a place where, in the distance, I can see Idaho's Seven Devils Mountains, which form the far side of, of Hell's Canyon. Um, I'm really happy to have you all with us today. Um, I'm just going to run through a few things before we get started. Uh, this is my first time emceeing one of these, but you'll all be glad to know that our trusty communications manager, Aaron, is there in the background really running things. So if things go awry, um, he'll get us back on track. Um, so just a quick outline of our hour-long program. Uh, we're excited to have Julian Matthews with us today. Uh, Julian is the coordinator for NIMIPU, Protecting the Environment. Um, I last saw Julian leading a flotilla down the Snake River in Lewiston to advocate for the removal of the lower Snake River dams. Um, he's an advocate for environmental issues and protecting Nez Perce treaty rights. Um, he's going to talk to us about the importance of the Snake River to his people who have lived here for time immemorial. Um, it's worth noting the other two speakers and I sit here on land that the Nez Perce never gave away. Um, Brock Evans is a living legend of the conservation community. Uh, over 50 years ago, he fought and won the unwinnable fight to stop the damming of the last wild stretches of the Snake River. Um, Brock championed the Hell's Canyon Wilderness National Recreation Area uh, um, and founded the Hell's Canyon Preservation Council. Um, and that organization has become and, and has, is Oregon Wild's closest and um, one of our most reliable al conservation allies. Um, they changed their name just a few years ago to the Greater Hell's Canyon Council. Uh, and our final speaker will be Christina de Villiers. Um, she's their connections coordinator and will share the work of her organization and their partners to connect, protect, and restore the natural system of the larger Hell's Canyon region. Um, and then following that, we'll uh, have some time for a question and answer session. Um, just a few logistics for those of you who haven't been on these webinars before. Um, you can enter your questions at any time using the webcast interface. Um, those questions will go to me and I'll ask as many of them at the end of the presentation as time allows. Um, if your screen suddenly freezes or you lose the presenter's slide deck, just try closing completely out of your browser uh, and then rejoining using the event um, uh, link that was emailed to you about an hour ago. That seemed to work for most people in the past. Um, if you're on a mobile, uh, you should be able to control which view you're seeing and how big it is by tapping on your screen. Uh, we'll have a video of this webcast uh, that we'll email out tomorrow, uh, and it'll be posted on our website, OregonWild.org, in the Wild blog section. Um, and then if you got a raffle ticket, uh, please check your email tomorrow. We'll contact winners to confirm their mailing address, um, and all you have to do is just reply to that email. Um, we've got a few other exciting webinars in the works, so please keep your eye on your email to learn more about what's next. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be working with my colleague, Jamie Dawson, for uh, one later this month, talking about owls and other wildlife that depend on Eastern Oregon's big trees uh, and remaining old growth forests. Um, and though it's gonna, we'll talk about owls, spoiler alert, no spotted owls out here. Um, and a sign up for those presentations will be in your inbox and the Oregon Wild website. So now that I'm done talking at you, um, I'm excited to present Brock Evans, who's with us from his home in LeGrand. Welcome, Brock. Thank you, Rob, and everybody, welcome everybody. It's great to see your faces. And I've got a, since I'm now just only 83 years old, I'm looking at the pictures right now, and I gotta tell you personally how wonderful it is to see all the rivers still free flowing. If there ever was a hopeless lost cause back in 1957 when I first got involved in the issue, it was saving any more dams on the snake. It had already been plugged, as you well know, and things like that. So to just see this and, see, and know you're all out there is a great personal joy, satisfaction to see this. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, 1957, I, I lived in Seattle. I'd, I was 29 years old then. I'd left a law practice because I was very upset by the logging in the North Cascades and wanted to try to save some places before they were all gone. And uh, so I worked for, I became the Sierra Club's Northwest representative, which then meant the four Northwest states plus Alaska and everything else like that too. And uh, so we were there and of course, most of the issues then were West side, um, but across the, across the river, the Snake River, which almost no one ever heard of before, came one Floyd Harvey, a boatman, who had a boat going over there, and he came and pled with us, uh, the so-called Sierra Club, remember 40,000 members nationally then across the whole country, uh, to please try to do something to stop this dam. Where's the dam? What's Hell's Canyon? What's it all like? And uh, having practiced law with a couple of one of the firms that wanted to build the dams here, I knew where it was. And so my executive committee said, well, okay, Brock, go take a look to it, see what we can do to try to help out here. And I was very gloomy, because I knew the only issue there was an issue in the Supreme Court, but it was only over which party got to build this 700 foot dam, not who would do it. And so I was gloomy and I didn't know what to do. This was in June and got to do something. 
And then all at once, a bombshell, wonderful bombshell drop in the form of a newspaper article saying Supreme Court sends Hell's Canyon case back for remand. Now, remember, this was the day way before anything environmental law. We weren't even called environmentalists until April, uh, Earth Day 1970, for pins. So it was way before any kind of law or things like that. But the Supreme Court made a decision on this case where it'll all be underwater now. It says, we are not yet going to decide who gets to build this dam. First, we're going to decide whether, whether, whether it should be built. The idea, well, that was an unheard of thing for the times. This was, these were the era when logging was king wherever there were big trees and dams were queen wherever there were rivers would be plugged and they were all being plugged. But there it was. And I thought to myself, I remember the day it's burned into my brain, June 6, 1967. I thought, aha, I'm a lawyer. I'm only a 21, 9-year-old lawyer and scared to death, but maybe here's an avenue. So uh, make a long story short, I figured out a way to intervene with a capital I and dreamed up a petition of intervention. I'd never seen the canyon before. Of course, we read a lot about it and knew all about, about that. And it was a petition for the lot of where is this and where is that? Please let us intervene in the case. We want to put on a case for what's called a wild river. Remember, they hadn't even passed the Wild Scenic Rivers Act yet. But anyhow, we were, that's what we wanted to do. And um, on the night of August, the deadline was September 1st. And I have it written down somewhere in 11.40 p.m. on the night of August 31st. Uh, I took the petition with all the plaintiffs signed on to it after I explained what a plaintiff was in those innocent days, and down there and send it off to SeaTac Airport to Washington, and by gosh, it made it on time, and so we were accepted into the case. And uh, now now it's common, you know, we talk about legal and political, this is, I think, it was the very first legal action to save anything that was ever filed in the Northwest, certainly. Yeah, so we were in the case, and that then the politics really burst loose there. The, the dam builders thought they had a cozy thing, they were gonna get permission, they're gonna join together, build a dam, and uh, and they had the, and so they were furious. So the trial, they had it all fixed with the trial judge. So we had to make a long story short. We had a three-year trial. Me sucking my thumb, wondering what to say with friends of ours. But but what what the trial did give it was give us a precious delay, three years of delay. And some of you may remember that that was the time when they wanted to plug up the Grand Canyon with dams too. So that was a great national issue, one of the very first ones. And so uh, it occurred to me, well. No one's ever heard of Hell's Canyon. This is the Glen Canyon of the Northwest. Let's make it a national cause. And that's where the political came. I, I made these new friends in Idaho or later became the Hell's Canyon Preservation Council. And we joined together and had strategy sessions and said, there's more to this place than just the river. As wonderful and magnificent it is, the deepest gorge in North America. It's also magnificent backcountry and canyons and forests and meadows. What can we do? Let's, see, let's do something bigger. So to make that story short, we got together, all of us who knew about it and cared about it, and drafted up legislation, which I finally finished. We had legislation to create, we call it a new thing, Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area. That had never been introduced before, but we knew that the only way we could save it was politically, by going to the whole people. We're not going to save it in this, pardon me, corrupt court that's going on right now. We can just get delayed. But we made a national issue of it. We drafted up the legislation. Uh, then what do we do? Well, we got to get someone to introduce it, right? Well, just by coincidence, wonderful coincidence, a guy named Senator Rob Pat, Bob Packwood, Republican, won the Oregon election for Senate that year. So I remember the next time I went back to Washington, about 1969, walked around, tried to get very the government to change their position against and be against the dams. And I went to see Mr. Packwood, and he and we showed him pictures of uh, some of the places like you're seeing right down here. And he said, my God, is all that in my state? And so he introduced the bill we drafted. So the next three years after all that, the legal trial still on it because that was priceless delay, priceless publicity for us across the country. We made a national campaign out of it as many as we could, us, you know, us people up here organizing and so on. But it was a very sympathetic public. Bills were introduced. Or I'm going to give you all the backs and forth on all that. It went back and forth and back and forth. And there were this kind of politics and that kind of politics and so on. But finally, on January of uh, December 31st, 1975, President Gerald Ford signed the bill for a 650,000 acre CNRA. So here we are, the, the legal, oh, I forgot to say, I, I demanded public hearing. You know, there am I don't, not know what to do, but I, I demanded that the legal trial also have public hearings in Lewis and in Portland. And that was our cool tool for organizing and turning out massive amounts of public support. Because before that, nobody thought we could ever beat the dam builders out here in the Northwest, because they plugged a lot of rivers. Anyhow, 
that that's a sort of a story how the legal and political were greatly intertwined and why we have a senator still around who introduced the bill for us and back and forth and now it's safe and it's very happy to look at it right down there below us and be able with all of you to share it thank you very much Oh, I'm ready for the next person. Or Julian, I think, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my name is Julian Matthews, and I'm an enrolled Nez Perce tribal member. And um, thanks a lot. For, uh, those spring back a lot of memories. I grew up in, um, I, I guess I should say a little piece here. I grew up in Idaho, Coeur Lane, and I was born in San Jose and moved up here. My mother I was full-blooded and she, my, my dad wanted her to be closer to her sisters. So I moved to the Coeur Lane Reservation, stayed with my aunt for about a year and, and then moved to Coeur Lane. <clears throat> and um, the thing I'd say about bringing back memories is um, my Coeur Lane and Kellogg was a Silver Valley at the time. And there's a lot of timber logging and timber potlatch was big. and Bunker Hill Mines. My brother worked at Bunker Hill for 10 years before they shut down. I was younger. And uh, so there was a lot of extraction industries, a lot of timber industry up that way and throughout Idaho. And <clears throat> so um, I was just thinking too, when Rock was talking about like, why did I get involved in this? Or why do I care? Or why is it important to me? And um, one thing that I found, I guess, it's just something that um, kind of wells up inside you that you feel kind of an amenity to protect these, uh, particularly even outside being a tribal member with our treaty, um, you feel kind of compelled to protect like the wilderness, uh, subway locks on wilderness area, other wilderness areas that, and then now with the treaty being a tribal member, I got hooked up with the Friends of the Clearwater and they, all the areas they were talking about were all within our treaty area. And so I really liked that and the tribe worked with them somewhat then um, we were involved in some early megalos protests to stop the uh, megalos from going here, through here to Alberta, Exxon Mobil, and FOC was involved, and uh, that was kind of a interesting venture. There was about 10 of us on the first um, megalo protesting, and then later on the tribe got involved. It took me about a year and a half to get the tribe to move, and so I was really happy when the tribal members were out on the road for four nights. We were out there, I was out there for two or six, and um, stopped them eventually through the court and with advocates of the west really good attorneys in Boise and different groups so um <clears throat> anyway i guess uh, now what drives me is to look at ways to protect these um the land and forests and water in idaho and the salmon particularly from further decimation and destruction so um i guess i'll just go through the first slide and so we set up this nonprofit and got official april of 2015 and started to um work on different issues set up meetings we're trying to come off the energy from that megalos protest because there's a lot of tribal members protesting out on the highway blocking the megalos and so that i thought we could kind of capture that energy and so we did capture that energy for about two months and it kind of dwindled out but in the meantime we've been working with other groups seventh generation fund getting money from them and uh prior to that we met with three uh, beaver creek tree Cree tribal members that lived next to the Tar Sands. We met out in the casino bar and uh, had some dinner and stuff. And I was there telling me about what was going on up there. So we supported them. And then, um, and that kind of gave us more impetus for that. And then, um, okay, next slide. So the goals of our group were Nimipu. That means the people in our language is Nimipu Tempt. And uh, so what we are focusing on primarily now and have in the past is protecting our treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather. And I hunt, fish, and gather, you know, under the treaty. And um, we mainly want to um, inform tribal members, adults, and, and we work with the youth during the school year, different activities and advocate with, we work with different groups, advocacy, do campaigns, and work with all kinds of different groups. I'm sorry if I haven't mentioned all of them in my presentation, but we work with a lot of groups, tribal, different tribes, uh, Lummi tribe on the west coast, west side, um, different Muckleshoot, they, a lot of groups fund us. So, okay, the next one. Yeah, these are some of the, um, what what happened is a lot of people, uh, one thing I noticed when I, I got my MPA from U of I in May 2000 and I started working my PhD. I just got to finish all the coursework and ed admin. But when I was going to school there, I realized um, when I got my MP that 
they didn't teach anything in the political science department at UMI about Indian tribal governments. And I was working for my tribal government. I couldn't figure out like why that was. And so um, I think the next semester I talked to Don, um, I forgot what his name was. He's the dean of the department head and told him, Ellie and I, Ellie Moppet, he's the president of our group right now. I thought we'd like to teach a tribal government class because a lot of these young people aren't learning about tribes and don't know anything about them because the school's academia is not really that interested apparently. And so we start teaching this class for one year and that turned out pretty good. And uh, so since then, even with working with different groups like Earth Justice, Sierra Club, Friends of the Clearwater, Save the Wild Salmon Coalition, it seemed like there was some kind of almost a disconnect between what the treaty was and kind of the um, ideas or thoughts on say dam removal, like people were saying recreational opportunities, you know, and that just kind of took me aback because I didn't really think of the river as a recreational opportunity. I mean, I swim in the river, I fish, and you know, I don't have a jet water, nothing like that. So, so we had, we worked with a lot of different groups and tried to include where we talk to them about, um, you know, not the tribes, because we don't represent the tribe, but as a tribal member, our perspective on it, like say with the salmon. And so uh, we work we work with a lot of groups and a lot of them are really supportive because the thing I found when we started was, I didn't even know what a campaign was. You know, I didn't really know, like I didn't even know I'd do a website or Facebook. So we had some help, pull them out over Montana, they helped. Um, they did our website for us and so um, I learned a little bit about it and so we've been doing that website and Facebook and so we're getting out the message on the Facebook particularly with the youth activities we have and so um, we have a pretty good thing going here with the different groups Earth Jess is still our partner we work with a lot of tribes on the canoe canoe families up and down the river Portland um, Salilo Falls canoe family um, different tribes along the river so okay next slide and then um, I guess I just kind of wanted to clarify um, what I was saying about a lot of people, even around here, you know, and there's some smart people in Moscow and Pullman getting their PhDs and graduate degrees and all that and, and you know, attorneys. But what I explained to what I sometimes they don't understand what a treaty is. And, you know, a treaty is we, we ceded the land. We didn't sell it to them or give it away or things like that. We ceded it to them. But this was, of course after a lot of issues dealing with the non-Indians of the tribe. And so we retained the rights to hunt, fish, and gather within our treaty area and our usual and custom. And usual and custom is where I can go fishing on the Columbia River Zone 6, like a lot of tribal members do, or I can go hunt buffalo in uh, Wyoming. And so these issues are really still there. And so we're trying to, our group, and working with the kids particularly, is to make sure that um, for the future that we retain the opportunities to exercise our traditional treaty rights on the river, you know, in Buffalo country or even around here, hunting moose, elk, um, whatever that they, the people want to hunt. Okay, so next one. And so we um, primarily, I guess, come to what we're here tonight for is the, um, we've had a lot of issues with the salmon on the river and um, like Brock was saying, the four lower snake burger dams were put into place. And the thing about it too was a lot of like they do, a lot of tribal members, like my uncles and cousins worked on the door shack dam. I just lived down there for a short period of time when they were finishing it. And so they had this um, idea like, um, well, this provides jobs, you know, but door shacks not really necessarily affects the river, the snake, but you know, things like that where jobs were provided. So now, you know, the, it's kind of like, to me, with these four lower snake, with all the money that's generated, um, they give out that money and our tribe receives a lot. We have the biggest fisheries program, I think, in the United States, but it's all, a lot of it's based on them receiving money from the BPA. The BPA paid for a hatchery down at Cherry Lane on the Clearwater, it's like 13 million. And so we've kind of become a part of the um, system, that hatchery fish production system, which I don't like. And so that's one of the battles that we have with um, breaching the dams. The poor lower snake is that we're going to have to figure out where the money or if they're even needed if those the poor dams here are breached on the snake. And so that's an issue because the tribe isn't a rich tribe. And so we have to make sure that, you know, because the tribe looks at what 
how can they provide jobs? You know, the people need jobs. And so with the hatchery, I realized a couple of years ago that that's a big issue. Like if we shut down the hatcheries, because they had these big settlements, SRBA and some others that were the tribe kind of took over, I think three of them, like co-managed two, I believe, and one they have full control up in Kuski, or maybe they all just have a partial control, but the tribe has that. So they hired tribal members and tribal members work there. And so things like that, that we have to look at. And then, like I said, with the, um, with the other issues going on, the main thing, okay, next slide. So this is just some information on the Snake River and then maybe um, go to the next one after this. One thing I'll, I will say um, before I get to this slide is um, the salmon have been diminishing even in the last five years. And so right now, like last year, they restricted the fishing, but, and this is mainly hatchery fish. Uh, most of them aren't native. Native are really protected, but the hatchery fish, so now, even most of the tribal members, they go wait for the run, go to the hatchery, they get their skate count numbers, get enough eggs, and then they shut the thing down. And so it's really like right now we can't fish. Uh, I can't fish. And so they shut it down. The tribe agrees to shut it down. And so it creates a lot of issues because right now um, there are some fish available down on zone six down in the Columbia where they like to tribal pay fishermen to bring fish back for ceremonies. Like today, there was a funeral for a former Netflix. So they have salmon at the dinner because that's a traditional food that we eat. But the problem is that those fish are diminishing, particularly Chinook. And to me, I haven't seen any solutions. And the biggest, the best solution, like I said, and that we're pushing for is to breach the dams. And, you know, they could go for full removal, but the breach, the dams were, these were designed to be breached. And like the other ones, like BPA or Bonneville, I mean, they were, they were concrete all the way across. And so, because even when people would say that, like remove the four lower snake, you know, I would be fairly content with breaching those four or leaving, getting rid of the earthen part. And so that's a big push with the flotillas. And we've had this is the fifth one last year. We're looking at maybe this one now, but with the coronavirus, of course, it may it probably will affect whether we have one or not. And um, then, okay, maybe go to the next one. One big issue that we use, um, like we found out about canoe carving from other tribes, Kalispell, Caldwell, and Coralina. So we decided to carve a canoe. And what we did was start, I uh, got a log from up in the subway, uh, yellow fur, I believe it was, with a special use permit that the council and that the Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee got for us, because you can't take trees up from a wilderness, a roadless area. So we got, and it wasn't cut down, because that was one thing I said, I don't want to be an environmentalist chopping trees down, you know, so. So we got one that was already down. And so we brought it down to Lapway, and then we got the kids there every Wednesday. And so we start carving it the dugout canoe and um, as it progressed and we started getting ideas that just like the kind of the idea was that we wanted to be able to float this canoe just like we did, you know, 150 years ago, up and down that river, whether for social, hunting, fishing, et cetera. And it kind of intertwined the idea that we couldn't do that with those dams there besides the impact it's having on the salmon runs. And so we did that. And then Earth Justice did a video called The Healing Journey and that's on YouTube now, and I think it's on our website. And so we, um, that was one thing um, big that came out of that whole experience that we're still, we're gonna work on another canoe. And the kids, we talked to them about, we meet every Wednesday during the school year, we talked to them about, you know, whatever it might be, the water, the dams, um, salmon, those types of, we have elders that come and talk to them about the cultural history of the tribe and respect for Mother Earth and things like that. And it's interesting that this week, um, they're have, supposed to have a rainbow gathering up there on um, Race Creek Road. It's up on the kind of little, the road is north of Riggin. So we drove up there, checked it out because the people were worried about what was going to happen, if they're going to tear up the land and stuff. And so we drove up there and hung out there for a while and then drove back and along this um, salmon and, sna and then the snake, or not the snake, the salmon. And then, um, so then we drove also, I drove up through Hawaii on the um, lower granite reservoir. And it's just that these things, for me, they're like right in your face. Like this dam is right in my face because I like to go swimming down at Granite Point. 
And so the Corps of Engineers, because I asked them before about things like, I mean, there's a lot of issues with these dams and the reservoirs. Because last year, there's a bunch of algae bloom, and I was trying to find out how much fertilizer these Palouse farmers can dump into that river or wherever it comes from. And it looked pretty clean today. But I think the big thing, because I know in that hot water affects the fish, that's another issue with the dams. Those reservoirs start getting hot. And during the summer, it just looks like kind of like this really gross, kind of like bubbling, some type of weird, when that water sits like that, that hurts the fish. When they go by the clear water paper mill, they dump that effluent from a white paper process and they have a fluent pond, but I don't think it, they dump, it's too hot, it kills the smokes. And so there's all these battles that, you know, the dams don't help. And then, uh, um, like I said, the fish production now, it's just mainly like a kind of a commercial venture, you know, let's produce some fish at the hatchery, put them into the river. Very few come back from the ocean. And so our position at Nimi Poo Protecting the Environment is that the dam breaching is, um, you know, and we're not saying that that's the only solution. There's a lot of other issues, but we feel that that will help. And then uh, a couple of years ago, we started tying it into the orcas because orcas like Chinook. And so the orca decimation is directly impacted by the Chinook salmon um, decrease in numbers. And so we're working with uh, different groups over on the west side. I think, I don't know if Brock, you might know Deborah Ellers. I think she worked for Holland and Hart, but things like that where we can tie it into the impact that it's not just up here on the Chinook or other salmon, but it's down on the ocean along the Columbia, because it's not just an issue here. It's, it's a, it's a really, it's a major issue in the Pacific Northwest. And so we're trying to continue to push for dam removal and we've got to our council and, you know, that's um, something that the council, our council hasn't come out and said, that, you know, you know, they don't put it on the paper saying breach the dams because they have certain political things, I guess. And so, um, but one good thing I did hear was that those herbal bolts that come up from the uh, Portland, they won't allow them because of the coronavirus to come up here because that's another reason they say they like those um, dams and the reservoirs is because for those boats, those paddle wheel type boats or they can come up to Lewiston on the, I think it's the only inland port or someone, they say that. So those kind of issues are big, but our major issue would be to breach the dams. And we feel that that would be a big uh, help to the um, migrating salmon. So I'm just glad that you guys uh, checked this out. And if you want to see our face for the website, feel free. And because this is a continuous battle, like Brock saying, you know, he's been dealing with it a long time. And I figure we'll be dealing with it for a long time because they just came out with the EIS on the, um, um, hydro, I think it's the Columbia River uh, system, and they didn't include dam breaching as a, uh, any in there. And so that's probably going to create another fight. I'm sure people are going to sue them, but it's just these issues are continuous and we just have to keep fighting. So, you know, appreciate any support that anyone out there would be willing to give us. And I'm not saying money necessarily, but just support like for helping us. And we have events or activities to attend those and support us and also thanks a lot. Thanks, Julian. Um, I, Aaron, thank you. Uh, and I will present. Hello. And my bandwidth is going to cooperate, I hope. Um, I'm Christina Civilier, Connections Coordinator for Greater Hells Canyon Council, an Eastern Oregon nonprofit that got its start alongside Brock, fighting for a freer Snake River. Fifty years later, we're still doing that, along with doing our damnedest to advocate for the ecological integrity of our spectacular home region. Our mission is to connect, protect, and restore the wildlands, waters, native species, and habitats of the Greater Hells Canyon region ensuring a legacy of healthy ecosystems for generations. As Connections Coordinator, I work to enhance ecological connectivity in our mission area. Ecological connectivity is the ease with which animals move through the landscape. Well-connected landscapes are increasingly important as climate change alters suitable habitat. Working on connectivity led me to the effort to free the snake. Maybe that seems obvious, 
connectivity is essentially about corridors versus barriers. And there's no more intuitive barrier in the world than a dam. A dam is a wall in the river. And many of the streams in my home region are impacted by four specific walls in the Lower Snake, Ice Harbor, Little Goose, Lower Monumental, and Little Granite Dams. And this graphic, courtesy of Xaver Wild Salmon, by the way, is just a, a reminder that Oregon has a thousand miles of amazing salmon streams that are impacted by the Lower Forest Snake River Dams. And we have a little catching up to do in terms of owning this issue. It's not just fish that need healthy rivers though. Terrestrial connectivity can be understood in terms of watersheds too. In Northeast Oregon, in these spectacular mountains and canyons, you can follow water 8,000 feet down from the peaks of the Wallowa Mountains to the depths of Hell's Canyon over just a few dozen miles. In a steep landscape like this, perennial waterways, streams and rivers, the canyons they've carved and their rich riparian zones are the most important corridors for nearly all wildlife. This is true throughout the interior west, and the deeper and steeper and drier the landscape, the truer it is. This means that the quality of riparian systems is all important for a huge number of species, both as they are living and moving now, and as they migrate to adapt to climate change. Some species, you could call them umbrella species for connectivity, have outsized impacts on the quality of riparian systems. Beavers are one, and I think we've already had a webinar about that. Another one is salmon. Salmon are the only wild animal that move calories and nutrients and minerals from the ocean back to headwaters. These are sake. Classic. Salmon. salmon. Gravity and erosion mean that most of the time resources slip away downstream. But every year, salmon and steelhead runs bring great pulses of nutrients from the ocean back into our interior waterways, benefiting ecosystems at every scale. In some Northwest riparian areas, half of the nitrogen in riparian vegetation is marine derived. Salmon need robust connectivity in the entire river network through which they travel. And they also contribute mightily to the quality of those connections. So the health of salmon runs is one important indicator of the quality of bioregional connectivity. Unfortunately, on that metric, our region is struggling. The Columbia River system was once one of the most productive salmon fisheries in the world. The snake up there in the well, up there in the middle <laughs> of the map, is, uh, is its greatest tributary, the gateway to thousands of miles of gorgeous spawning streams in Oregon and, I and Idaho. Rivers like the Lostine, the Amnaha, Joseph Creek, the Grand Ron, and the aptly named Salmon River. In the last century, humans transformed our region's greatest living system into a machine. To get back and forth between the ocean and the northeastern Oregon and Idaho headwaters where they spawn, Snake River salmon and steelhead have to cross eight dams, four on the Columbia and four on the Snake. Each blockage, the dam itself and the hot slack water reservoir behind it, which Julian just described in such nauseating detail, whittles away at the runs. At least 4 million wild salmon and steelhead used to spawn annually in the Snake River Basin. Now fewer than 60,000 wild fish return. Every Snake River salmon and steelhead population is on the endangered species list. What did those 4 million fish mean for Northeast Oregon? You've heard from Julian the importance of salmon to the Nez Perce. The Mimiku used to eat salmon every day. Uh, the tribe estimates 300 to 600 pounds per person per year. Early trappers in this region complained about spawning salmon swamping their canoes. Enough sockeye returned yearly to Wallowa Lake in the far northeast corner of Oregon to support two canneries for a while. Despite catastrophic declines of the runs, many communities in Oregon still rely on Snake River fish. 
In rural Northeast Oregon, my home, dozens of career jobs and fisheries depend on Snake River salmon. Guiding, outfitting, and riverside hospitality account for hundreds more jobs. Nez Perce, Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla people still fish here and have been leaders in fish recovery in the region. Fish, fishermen chasing salmon and steelhead spend $12 million a year in the three Northeast Oregon counties, just those three. Bonneville Power Administration has spent $250 million a year for 30 years mitigating for effects of the Snake River dams, including many habitat restoration projects like the one pictured here on the upper Grand Ronde. All these restored streams are just vacant housing if fish populations continue to crash. On the other hand, imagine what a boost restored runs could be for Oregon's rural economies. But some scientists are saying we're looking at 20 years before these runs are extinct. The status quo is not working, not for salmon and not for the communities and ecosystems that depend on them. All big dams are harmful to fish, but the four Snake River dams are also at the end of their useful lives. They're pushing their expected lifespans of 50 years. They provide together only 4% of the region's power. They're in need of expensive, expensive repairs. The water in their reservoirs is only getting hotter, sometimes hot enough to outright kill adult salmon, as in 2015 when half the sockeye and returning to the Columbia Basin died due to hot water. The federal agencies that own and operate the Lower Snake River dams, Bonneville Power Administration and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, acknowledge that dam breaching on the Lower Snake would benefit Snake River salmon. But these agencies continue to propose minor tweaks to the status quo, like increasing spill during peak migration season. That's not nothing, but it's not enough especially given accelerating climate change. Everyone is sick of lawsuits, but inertia at these federal agencies is real. And we are very frankly running out of time. Now is the time to demand that our leaders step up to reimagine our region's waterways for the increasingly climate impacted future. And people are stepping up. That's Julian there in the middle holding up his phone across the political spectrum, including at high levels, the will is mustering to rethink our region's hydro system for the 21st century. Last year, Greater Hills Canyon Council joined the multi-entity, multi-state, multicultural coalition that's pushing to restore the Lower Snake, while also finding creative solutions for all communities who depend on it. Across the Northwest, the public NGOs, tribes, infrastructure and policy and ecology nerds community leaders, business owners, and political players are coming together to press for a collaborative legislative solution for the snake, moving beyond the agency gridlock. Some communities count on services the Lower Snake River dams provide, including grain barging, which is the main use of these four dams, and irrigation around Ice Harbor Dam. If these dams come out, we need to find solutions for these communities, and we can. No one wants salmon to go extinct or farmers to go broke. If all the region's interests come to the table together and think boldly, we can maintain clean, reliable, and affordable power, bring Snake River salmon back to abundance. That's the goal, right? Not just to keep them off the, off the extinction list, but abundance, fishable abundance, and help save the endangered southern resident orcas that depend on these fish. And we can create a more prosperous future for everyone who relies on the lower snake, including farmers, sport fishers, business owners, tribes, and families across the region. And we must do this because salmon are in crisis, orca that depend on salmon are starving, communities whose identities are inextricable from healthy salmon runs are struggling, and the energy and agricultural sectors have needs too. To me, the effort to free the lower snake is an important test run for other related huge environmental crises we must work together to solve, like climate change. Our problems are interconnected and our solutions need to be interconnected too. We can and must solve problems with and for each other. Experts estimate that breaching the four lower snake river dams will quadruple fish runs in Northeast Oregon streams. 
Breaching these dams will be the centerpiece of the greatest salmon restoration effort in history and the greatest river restoration project in the West. Breaching these dams will restore access to thousands of miles of high quality habitat in Oregon and Idaho, streams we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars restoring for these fish. Greater Hills Canyon Council, my organization, got its start preventing a dam. You heard about that from Brock. It's such a story. That's why this landscape in Hills Canyon still exists. Dams aren't the only challenge facing salmon, God knows. Runs are declining everywhere for a host of reasons. But what I know is that if you're trying to prevent a death by a thousand cut, and you know the identity of four of the deepest gashes, to stop inflicting those is a good start. Our coalition is aligning diverse interests to push together for regional solution that moves beyond the agency gridlock into a more holistic, more climate smart, more connected future for the snake and the broader Columbia River Basin. If you wanna help, we would welcome your help. If you wanna help solve problems for all, if you care about the future of Snake River salmon in Oregon and the broader ecological integrity of our region's waterways, again, benefits for all species, please get involved. A great place to start for our coalition's efforts is www.northwestopportunity.org. That's the coalition's website, um, dozens of NGOs and, and others. Um, please get on the mailing list. You'll get action alerts specific to this issue from a coordinated group of advocates who are working hard to free the snake and leave no community behind. And if you've got a story to share about Oregon's fish or rivers or what our communities value and need, that website's a great hub to share it where it might make an impact. And finally, if you have Northeast Oregon connections, and want to get more involved on the ground here to move this effort forward, either publicly or quietly, I encourage you to reach out directly to me, Christina at hellscanyon.org. I hope Aaron might be able to put those couple of links in the follow-up email for this. Again, that's Christina at hellscanyon.org and ournorthwestopportunity.org. Thanks so much to Oregon Wild for hosting this conversation and to Brock and Julian for your important thoughts. Um, I hope everyone has a good night. It's kind of sad not to see your faces, but um, but yeah, I hope you have a good night and I hope you're doing well. These times are crazy. So that's all from me. Thanks, Christina. Um, yeah, don't go away. Um, the rest of you, we have a little bit of time to um, take some questions and answers. Um, I'm just going to get my webcam back up here. Um, and hopefully you can hear me. Uh, looks like it. So that's good. Um, but yeah, there are a few questions uh, that I've already gotten, and I'll do my best to ask as many of the other presenters as I can. Um, uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to just put them in the in the chat box, and I will again get to as many as I can. Um, so the very first question that came through, I think, was directed towards Brock. Um, and Brock, the question was: um, Was Frank Church a figure in the early Hell's Canyon issues with the Bureau of Reclamation? God, good question. Can you hear me? Is it, sure am I can. coming? Okay, great. Yep. Uh, no, and that's a very good question. Uh, he was known as the, uh, you know, champion conservationist from Idaho, and he was. He's a good guy, and I liked him a lot. But when when us upstarts first came along and challenged this dam, uh, it might have been an election year. We have a little slogan about him, a friendly one. You know, for the two years before he's being reelected, he's just different than he is right after, and things like that. So. Well, so, so it was easy for easier for Bob Packer to be an elected Republican to be on our side, and he believed it. Frank, I think, believed all these things, but there were political considerations naturally from there and with the previous dam song. So no, he was not a figure early on. When when it became obvious it was a national issue and so on, he he never was opposed to um, what we were doing. I mean, he was, but he he became a major champion of it in the last few years of it say 72 or 73 to 75. But he wasn't a figure in the beginning. Great. Thanks, Brock. Um, and I'm going to ask because we got a question about um, folks's uh, websites. So Julian and Christina, uh, when the question comes your way, if you could just tell folks what your websites are, that would be great. Um, and actually, this is a really good one. Um, who needs to, well, I'm going to combine two questions. First of all, what is the difference between breaching a dam and dam removal? 
Uh, and then who would, who needs to be convinced to to breach the dams? Who do we need to convince? From from what I know, like I talked to Jay Gil Modell, he worked at the um, Corey. Actually, he worked on that first EIS, and he said the Corps of Engineers in Portland could do it. But you know, of course, around here, and I know McMorris Rogers because I live in Washington, Eastern Washington. She's you know this whatever she is, Senator. And so um, she says they need congressional action. They really don't, but I think the Corps of Engineers and um, the B, I don't, the BPA, I think they just get the money from the power generation. The Corps could remove them, but of course it's really a, a political hotbed. So essentially the Corps could remove them, but they don't really want to because I'm sure they have a lot of political pressure, particularly right now with Morris Rogers in there. And, some, and, and one thing that's really disappointing to me is like, you know, I like uh, Senator Catwell. She marches in the Pullman Metro Festival. I march with her and, and um, the other one over on the west side. They don't really have come out in support of removing that. It just seems like removing the dams, you know, they could do it, but it just doesn't seem like there's a political power to do that right now or the uh, political necessity. And so that's really a big issue about how and when we can remove but the core i believe can remove them if they want the breach the breaching of the like i was saying the breaching if you look at the lower granite it has a half of its earth kind of earth and they call it and that the breaching would be removing that part and though some of the water would be free flowing the removal would be just the whole thing like i said on uh, bonneville i think they're all concrete so you'd have to remove the whole thing there's no um earthen part on those so there is a difference between earth, the earth and the dams that can be breached and the other dams that are all concrete, basically, essentially. I would just add to that that the, the reason the price tag looks so high and some of these estimates for dam removal is that they're looking at taking out all the infrastructure taking it all the way and that is that's a project but as julian says these four snake river dams were all designed actually the only make the river run around that Parts of the, the river taking out all of the costs. To be convinced, you know, our coalition is that the AP was stalled as they've been to convince our, our region leaders. Washington has good. Uh, so, solution for the river that would reimagine first century. I hope I'm not interrupting, Christina. Your bandwidth is having a little bit of a problem. I think a few folks were having a hard time hearing. Um, so, we're going to kind of just move on and, and hopefully that'll improve in just a second here. Um, so I'm gonna ask a question um, that I think might be more directed uh, towards Julian, uh, which is um, aside from fishing, um, what traditional practices um, have been impeded by by the dams and other development? Well, well, the, the main one is fishing and there's some effects that like uh, Christina was saying about the um, creeks and rivers up in the mountains or, or along the river that are impacted by the, uh, because like if you go down to say um, Lapway, the river is higher there. When I was little before or before the dam, dams that those, there were beaches along that. And so there was a lot of areas that the tribe could go down and utilize. And so it's affected the, like Lapway Creek, there's a lot of plants and medicines that grew there. So those are being impacted as the water is so high now that it's just totally changed that. And so that that's the main one. I'd say with the, um, you know, it's the fish, the salmon, and some of the riparian areas that uh, border off or are offshoots of the river because 
like I said, if you go down there, that water is really high and then it also is affected by the, the creeks down on the clear water affected because door shack, what she was saying, they release that water because it's cold. The wa bottom water is where it comes out of it, so it's cold because they release that. So that whole kind of mechanism is affecting the banks, the shore banks, the river banks, et cetera. So, but there's, that's mainly what it, I would say the salmon and some of the plants and medicines that grow along mm -hmm. those areas because the water level is different, it changes. Great. Um, and a lot of good questions coming in, so I'm going to keep doing as many as I can in the time we have. Um, a couple questions about hatcheries, um, and one in particular, and Christina, you look a lot clearer, so I'm, I'm optimistic uh, it'll work. Um, but somebody asked, I don't know very much about fish hatchery, BPA fish hatcheries. Uh, can you explain in more detail the opposition behind uh, those hatcheries? I'll do it. Okay, so the opposition that I personally have against fish hatcheries is that, like right now, like I said, with uh, some of the settlements, like the SRBA, I think they, or Fino, I believe, and the Kuski fish hatchery were kind of given to try to co-manage, and then they paid $13 million for, uh, the BPA did for a fish hatchery along uh, Cherry Lane on the other side of the um, river on the clear water and you know of course this my opinion here is kind of at odds with a lot of you know fisheries employees and fisheries staff as a lot of tribal members but the problem with those is it's kind of created this what it is is like a okay what happens there is like they they get the eggs like this round this year they'll get the eggs they'll um hibernate them or whatever hatch them and then they'll release those smolts when they're old enough to go back down to the ocean and um, and then they come back eventually. But the biggest problem with that is those fish, like a friend of mine told me years ago, is those smolts or baby fish, that's a better term, they, they're supposed to float to the ocean. They don't swim. And so the problem now is those reservoirs with the, dam the dams with the reservoirs now create this problem where those smolts can't go down to the ocean like they did before. And so that you have but essentially these hatcheries are just like fish production facilities. They get the eggs, they hatch them, they release them. Some of those fish in a few years come back, they get the eggs out of them. And then, you know, they go up the fish ladder. I mean, you could go up, if you ever get a chance, they're worth checking out because it's, it's like a fish industry to me. And, you know, which I don't think our tribe should be a part of, you know, there's a lot of council that probably don't, I know they don't agree with that or they, they feel that it's working right now, but it's not. And so fish hatcheries are just like these, kind of facilities that produce fish. And so um, they're trying to get, instead of native, they're trying to get these fish that the state of Idaho can uh, sell fish tags, uh, licenses, you know, jet boats and all these big industries now revolve around this fish production. So essentially to me, I just don't, I think if they remove the, the breach to dams at least or remove them, that would help the fish spawning up in our in the headwaters up in our area up in the subway locks on other areas so that way there would be native species not because even yet they really don't know how those fish affect humans because they i know i do know when they a lot of times when they catch the fish they inject them with antibiotics and you know a lot of it that stuff they're putting i have no idea what they put in there so if i go fishing catch a fish that's a hatchery fish i don't know how that is going to affect me at least with native you know that is not there's no artificial kind of substances injected into it so those kind of issues i mean it's really it's really a big it's really complicated i didn't realize um how complicated that whole um concept of uh, fisheries are with hatcheries because you know they figure if they inject them they won't get certain types of bacteria or if they go to the ocean and come back that type of thing so it's really interesting to see and, and and of course there's a lot of money goes into that like those the bpa pays for the, what they call o m money for the hatchery that we have and so like i said get breached the dams electric power generation reduced so then what happens to the tribes funding for those programs so it's kind of a which you know to me i mean they should have thought about that when they did it but um because those salmon are more important to me than you know a lot of the offshoots of benefits that they get right now but Hatcheries are basically just fish production machines, and that's what they're designed to do, try to produce fish and get more in the river to catch, so. 
Thanks. Uh, and Christina, your um, camera's turned off to help with some bandwidth, but uh, we should be able to hear you. And this question might be one that you're able to answer um, pretty quickly, which is, um, where is the Oregon congressional delegation on breaching the Lower Snake River dams? And anybody can answer for sure. I would say the Oregon congressional delegation is uh, in a good position to be pressured by their constituents right now. <laughs> That's what I would say about that. Very diplomatic. Uh, great. Um, I want to get at least two more questions in. I think we have just a few more minutes. Um, and another one that I think is is a good one, just to better understand, how important are the Snake River dams for producing electricity? The Snake River dams produce uh, four to five percent of the region's electricity on a good day. Okay, um, let's see. So yeah, another question kind of following up on that, who needs to be convinced? Um, is the Army Corps of Engineers the only one uh, who can make the decision to remove the dams or can somebody else do that? Can somebody make that decision for them? Well, I think one thing that we always felt is that to try under the treaty, they could they could force the issue by suing the federal government under the treaty of 1855. But see, that's the thing is that's really a major issue. But I think that's really right now, that seems to be one of the few options that we have because it's just like right now, it's just continuing to spiral down and it seems like no one's really doing anything and they come out with this new EIS that says dam breaching isn't in there. And so we're gonna have to, you know, and it, a lot like Christine is saying, there's a lot of people suing the federal government, suing the core. And so, and, and even that, I mean, it's good to stop certain actions, but they need to really look at breaching the dams. And so we're trying to convince our tribal government, the NEPTIC tribal, Nesper's tribal executive committee to um, take action, legal action, to either force or removal, because under the ESA, I think that that's our only option right now, because I don't think the core is going to move. It's too political, and then you got, the, like I said, I live in Washington, so you got Morris Rogers and then uh, Murray and Capwell. They don't seem that interested in it, or you don't hear them coming out. And we invited to them to our summit. You don't see them coming down and say, "Yeah, we support this, and we're going to spearhead it." And so I think it's really. Um, I think under a treaty is a big thing. That's why we always press the issue that we have a treaty right with the federal government and it hasn't expired and we're not, they're not living up to their end of it. So we have to convince the tribe or else figure out how I or others have a standing in the court to take action to force the issue and, and call for the breaching as the only solution. So, I mean, it's a complicated issue. I'm not an attorney, but that's something that we've been looking at or trying to figure out how to do that because right now it's just a stalemate, you know. Steady as she goes, as they say in the Navy, I guess. Thanks. Well, and uh, from the political angle, I'll just opine uh, a, a favorite quote I've heard is uh, politicians are wind vanes. It's our job to make the winds blow. And so I think uh, that's what the groups that are working on this are trying really hard and, and counting on people's support um, to, to help. And um, second to last question um, at this point, what's the overall quality of spawning habitat in the Snake River, Snake River tributaries? And so I guess. Maybe I'm just kind of guessing that part of that question is if the dams come, you know, go out or are breached, um, is there good habitat for all those fish to go to in those tributaries that are, are so wide ranging? Pristine habitat in much of Idaho and or Northeast Oregon has some beautiful, some beautiful salmon streams too. And again, BPA has been spending $250 million a year every year for the last 30 years on mitigation efforts and a lot of that's hatcheries but a lot of that's habitat restoration we've done a ton of work restoring habitat to make uh to make good housing for fish that is now sitting sitting pretty vacant sadly yeah our tribe does that's first tribal fisheries does a lot of um habitat restoration planting trees and you know riparian zones and that type of thing so i think a lot i think they, they like she said they do a lot of that type of work and I guess they're waiting for the fish now. Yeah. All right. Well, there are a lot of some more good questions that I apologize I'm not going to get to. So if yours is one of them, uh, you can blame it on me. Um, but a good good wrap up question, and it's I apologize if I missed this during the presentation. But what can I do right now as a citizen to voice my opinion about dam removal? Um, what would you tell folks for that? And maybe I'll give that to uh, all three of you guys.
Well, uh, this is Brock. You know, there are many things to do, and this has been very enlightening. Thank you for all that. But as as someone has lived through a bunch of things that were considered impossible, uh, once and seen them come successes, uh, it does take, as you said, making the winds blow. Well, you don't you don't do that by all of the senators or congressmen saying, "How do you feel about this?" You prepare the ground first. You go up and down with slideshows or with conferences like this or things like that. In 1988, we were uh, disturbed across the Northwest about the pace of logging and after we'd saved some places. So we called a major thing which came, became the ancient forest conference. How are we gonna escalate? How are we gonna build it up and make it a regional cause? Well, we did. We got the Ancient Forest Protection Act by 1995, the new forest plan. It wasn't perfect. We were gonna save a hell of a lot more big old trees that would have been saved otherwise. This could happen too. This can be. We've got some great people with some great thoughts about it, and we can make those wins more. We just have to get started. Remember right. one, one final thing. Well, you know, I won't, no, I'll tell you, sir, but, but just getting started with a major campaign and saying, here's what we really, really want. We all know it, and there's a lot of good stuff here, but you know, I was going to tell you a story, but I won't bother you with it now. <laughs> Julian or Christina? I would say that right now, the right now the best thing that you could do if you're an Oregonian is to contact uh, Kate Brown, thank her for uh, for authorizing Oregon's DEQ to um, to monitor temperatures and enforce federal temperature regulations on the federal dams, and say we need to go one step further and and take these dams out. And contact your contact um, Wyden, Merkley, Defazio, your elected who represent the Northwest and our state in Congress and ask them to consider a legislative solution that uh, that removes dams as one of the as one of the pieces of the puzzle of rethinking our region's hydro system for the 21st century. It's only one of the pieces. Other pieces need to happen too, but um, but uh, we think that, as as Julian said, the word stalemate is there. <laughs> we think that the the agencies are not likely to move on this, but the, but le legislatively, a solution can can happen. And in fact, we think legislation is being drafted, and and it needs to be a northwest it needs to be a northwest solution. So contact your folks and ask for that. And again, uh, northwestopportunity.org has, uh, has a, is going to have a lot of targeted action items for this particular topic. Julian, I think yeah. the last word is yours. Yeah. Yeah, that's what um, I would suggest is contact. I know because um, there was a guy in um, Simpson in Idaho, he, he was kind of come out so supporting a, a dams or dam removal breaching or the salmon industry. And I think that's important to, um, like when they have any types of campaign or I went down and talked at the, uh, when Little, Little had his um, salmon thing down in Lewiston, explained our position. And then same thing with this uh, Inslee task force came to Clarkson, went down there, you know, just get involved and listen and learn. And it's just like with the uh, Columbia River Keepers, there's a lot of small groups out there that are doing a lot of, Columbia River Keepers just had that lawsuit about the uh, warm water or the temperature in the water. And so that's really critical and those types of things, um, but there's different groups to get involved with, right? Your Senator, right, right your Congressman, but we try to, that's what we're trying to work on now is to not just, you know, like it seems like right now, to be honest, everyone's just, you know, I like this kind of stuff because of the coronavirus, but it's like everyone, you know, takes the summer off and, you know, to me, it's just like, I compare, I compare it to the tar sands, you know, they're still getting oil out of the tar sands and it's still ruining the environment. So these things aren't just going away, or, you know, it's like, oh, it's, let's stop doing it because it's the summer or the winter, we have to keep at it. And that's why we keep pushing our tribe, which they don't like, you know, we say, hey, we need to reach these dams. And so, you know, just get involved. And like she's saying, go to our website, go to her website or any of these different. And because what we need to do is keep pushing it and have a central, uh, focused effort on on this activity and you know and sometimes I feel that people are kind of lagging but uh, we're going to continue working on pushing this issue getting out there you know we do articles for the paper you know that type of thing and so we're trying to keep it out there in the public eye so people remember that it hasn't gone away and those salmon are not are going to go, go extinct unless we do something thanks
Well, thanks. Yeah, it's not a normal thing for a Republican from Idaho to be better on an environmental issue than Oregon's delegation uh, or Washington. So uh, certainly time for them to hear from everybody who's who's participated and might be listening to the recording. Um, so yeah, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, again, please keep an eye on your inbox to see if you won the raffle. Uh, get Brock's book um, as well as Chandra's um, and to learn about some of our future webinars, including some more that we'll be doing out here in Northeastern and Eastern Oregon and, and the wildlife and wild places out here. Um, and then again, of course, um, I hope you guys will look for opportunities to support groups like the ones you heard from tonight, including Nimipu, Protecting the Environment, uh, and Greater Hell's Canyon, who are on the front lines fighting the good fight against some really powerful interests uh, to ensure that our natural systems continue to function. Um, so yeah, have a great night. Uh, thanks, uh, Brock, Julian, Christina. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, and thanks for helping us keep Oregon wild. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rob. Brock, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you.